What is happening, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the 182 News Podcast. This is your host, Poppin' Curbs, and I appreciate you making me a part of your day. Fresh off the season three finale, we took Take Off Your Pants and Jacket versus Untitled, track by track, head to head, to declare a winner. I know a lot of folks were thinking Untitled would run away with that, but I'm telling you, when you take those side by side like we did, it gets really interesting. I saw a lot of Toy Patch victories, just saying. Today is the season four premiere. I am so stoked to get this episode out. I could not wait. We are joined by an extremely special guest, Ian Grushka of Newfound Glory. Honestly, one of my favorite pods I have ever recorded. We talk about how he got into music, being a fan of Blink early on, some of the shows he went to, until eventually he was sharing a stage with them just a few years later. We talk about the formation of Newfound Glory, what their plans are for this upcoming year, and we even hit on his baseball card, which is so rad. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to jump right into it. Honestly, it may be all downhill from here for the pod, so soak this one up, pun intended. All right, talk soon, everybody. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now joining us on the 182 News Podcast, very special guest, Ian Grushka from the band New Found Glory. Ian, what's up, dude? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me here. Hey, no problem. Stoked. Uh, you and I had chatted a couple times. We have a mutual interest in, I think, baseball, baseball cards, and a little band called Blink-182. Yes. <laughs> Stoked to get you on. Uh, to kick us off, man, I, I got to go origin story just a little bit here. I'm very curious to hear how you got into music in the first place, kind of what you were listening to at that time, and kind of lead us up into that formation of Newfound Glory in 1997. My origin of music, uh, growing up, I was listening to a lot of like the golden oldies, stuff like Buddy Holly. Um, Cause that's what my dad kind of listened to. And then, uh, you know, the beach boys. And then I really started, uh, getting off into different kinds of music when I would listen to like my brother's records and he was listening to like twisted sister and quiet riot and guns and roses and Stormtroopers of death. Like I remember SOD was one of those bands. I was probably like eight years old when we were living in New York, still listening to, uh, Stormtroopers of death. Um, then the big change for music, I guess, came for me. Uh, and uh, when I was in high school, I used to go watch this kid, Evan, play drums around the corner from my house. And he, he would like play drums to like Alice Cooper songs. And I was like, oh man, this is so awesome. And then I had a couple of buddies that played guitar and they were playing like Metallica songs and Megadeth and all that stuff. And I realized, uh, I was like, man, this is, stuff is really hard to play. So I would try to like, they were like ripping solos on guitar and I couldn't really keep up on uh, rhythm guitar. So I wound up switching to bass. Um, but then the big change in high school, I was probably like 17, I want to say at the time. This was probably like 1994, 95-ish. Um, I had a friend that I met at school and he moved to Florida from Poway. Um, and he introduced me to uh, like Blink-182, Unwritten Law, um, like No Effects, Strung Out, like all the fat record sort of stuff, Screeching Weasel. Um, so I started listening to Blink uh, probably around, uh, I want to say this was right around like the Cheshire Cat times. I remember because my original Cheshire Cat just had the blink on it. It wasn't, mm. the, it wasn't the 182 yet. So early on blink. Um, and then, um, then I started realizing that punk rock was a lot easier to play than heavy metal was. Um, and that's kind of where I made the transition of trying to be in a punk band um, instead of uh instead of a metal band because it was just easier to play for me 
at that point, did you have your own bass guitar and you were kind of, you're set in your ways, you're going to be a bass player? So I ha- I started playing guitar at the age of 13. Um, when I was 17, this is also a funny story. I met this kid. Uh, so I saw this kid get in a fight in school. And I was like, oh, man, I was awesome. And then he was sitting right next to me in my next class. And I realized that he had just transferred to our school. And I looked over at him and he had this piercing like between like the web, the the skin between his thumb and his pointer finger. And it was like a pot leaf uh, earring. And obviously in high school, I smoked a lot of weed. Um, So I was like, dude, this kid is cool. We got in a fight. He's got a weed leaf piercing. So I was like, it was like, we got to hang out. And then so I introduced myself to him and we started, you know, hanging in school and and he's like, yeah, he's like, I, I moved here from, uh, from Bremerton. I'm like, I'm like, Bremerton, like MXPX Bremerton. He's like, yeah, I went to the same high school as them. And I'm like, yeah, out of here. No, you didn't. So then I wound up talking to him. He shows me his yearbook and it's him in the yearbook. And it's the guys from MXPX in his yearbook. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I was like, I want to, I want to start a punk band. I want to play bass. And he's like, I've got a bass and a bass amp. I'm like, get out of here. He's like, I'll sell it to you for 50 bucks. So I bought this bass and this amp for 50 bucks. Turned out that he, uh, he told me that he cut the roof off of a convertible with a machete and stole a bass and an amp. (laughs) So that was my first bass and my first bass amp I bought, like stolen uh, for 50 bucks. So that's how I started playing bass. Did you start a band with that? I did. My first few bands were definitely using that bass and amp. And the bass, I feel like the bass is gone for sure. I don't know where it is. I put a bunch of like stickers on it. It was like some red, like no name bass. Um, and I think I sold that to to buy like uh, another bass or something, which I don't have that one anymore either. So Cheshire Cat, especially if you had the the pre-182 one, so that was basically February 1995 is when that came out. Your inspiration to start a band and go down the route with with a bass guitar, was that inspired by Blink? Like when you heard that music come from California, were you like, oh shit, this is the type of music I want to play and I got to start a band? Or, you know, what years were those bands kind of starting off for you? So for me, I was... I was more of an Unwritten Law fan at the time of like Unwritten Law Blue Room. Um, and I would listen to that so much. And when when Unwritten Law would come through Florida, they would always tour with Blink. Those two guys, they always like toured together. So that's how I got like, I liked Blink, but I loved Unwritten Law. Um, and then it just became like a love for both because it was always, they always toured together. Um, but I think that for me, uh, when I was in my band before Newfound Glory, um, my goal at the time was always to move to San Diego and start a band out there. I thought, I thought that you had to like, the kind of punk that I liked was like the West Coast punk. Um, so I always like had this dream growing up of, you know, moving to San Diego and starting a punk band out there. And I was going to be successful and I was going to tour, but I didn't really know anything about music or San Diego or anything. Um, and then I had it set up to where the kid that moved down here, there was a family he knew that was going to let me live with them and go out there and start a band. And I just, uh, it just never happened. I wound up, you know, starting a band down here instead. Um, and just never, uh, never went out there. But I think that for me, Unwritten Law, uh, especially Rob Brewer, their old guitar player, he was kind of the person that made me want to tour. Um, because whenever Unwritten Law and and Blink would come down to Florida, I would hang out with them. I'd follow all the shows through Florida. And I was just like, man, I, that's what I want to do for a living. I want to be in a band. Mm. 
you've shared some sick photos, dude. I swear, occasionally, like every couple months, you'll just find like a sick blink photo from 1996 in your front row, like right in front of Tom. <laughs> um, how many times did you see them back then? I mean, you mentioned that you would hang out with them, follow them around. I mean, did you talk to Mark and Tom at the time or were you just kind of a, a fan behind the scenes or what? Yeah, so I, um, I would always, I would talk to them all the time. So the weird thing is I was closer with Mark before Newfound Glory started <laughs> than I was after. Um, because when they would play, like, dude, we, you know, me and my brother, would we'd go to like all the Florida shows. We would just go everywhere. We would just follow them. And, and a lot of times they'd be, it would be a 15 passenger van and it would be Blink and Unwritten Law in the same van. Um, Sometimes, like, you know, I remember one time Wade from UL, he rode with me and my brother because he wanted to get out of the van. We would always sleep on the floor in Unwritten Law's hotel room. We basically, what I would do is I would, I would work my job. I would save up my money. I would buy as much weed as I could. And then I would bring that fall Unwritten Law around and smoke weed with them and then just crash on their hotel floor at the end of the night and then wake up, just hop in the car and go to the next city. Um, so we were always around for like sound checks. You know, we would just be hanging with Unwritten Law like the whole day. And the Blink guys were always around, but I was definitely closer with uh, UL than I was with Blink. Um, I can remember one time uh, being in a hotel, we're smoking a bunch of weed with Unwritten Law and Tom walks in the room and Tom and Mark and Scott, they didn't really smoke weed back then at all. Scott was always like in a corner, just like reading a book or like, he's always super quiet. So we would talk to him here and there, but he was really like quiet and he was kind of just there, you know what I mean? And, and the way that it was with Blink back then, it's like you go to Blink shows and it was, it was all about Mark and Tom. Scott was there. He was a great backbone, but he had like four different drum beats that he played. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you'd go to see Blink, it was just like, all right, what are Mark and Tom going to do next? And then like jumping forward, once Travis got in the band, it changed the whole dynamic of the band because now you just watch Travis. He's, <laughs> he's just so good at drums. It like took the dynamic of Mark and Tom away. Yeah. Because he's just so he's so much better of a musician than than they are do you know what i mean <laughs> not taking anything away from him but like travis plays and you're just like your jaw drops you're just like holy crap he, yeah i always laugh uh tom always says when travis joined the band he and mark were worried that travis was going to kick them out of blink yeah he's just dude he's just really good <laughs> so you know so jumping back a little bit i remember we were smoking with uh unwritten law in the hotel room and tom walked in and he like never smoked ever so he like pulls the joint out and, and he hits it and he look and then he hands it back to me after he hits it once and he goes thanks a lot now i can't be an astronaut <laughs> and goes, okay and then he like walked out of the room and i think that was back then that was probably the only time that i smoked with tom because he never like i said he never like was a pot smoker then Oh my gosh, that is hilarious. So I mean, like Tom was always like, he was always into that sort of weird shit back in the day. But I will say that like the whole aliens thing, like it was always Wade from Unwritten Law that was into the alien stuff first. Wade always would be drawing aliens and shit on pictures back then. So it's crazy that like, Tom became like the big alien thing, but like, I'm curious to, to know Tom's take on that if Wade was the one that got him into it. Cause definitely <laughs> Wade was always in out of space. He That's was funny. Yeah, and I mentioned to Mark that you and I had been talking and you know how you had some rad photos from back in the day. And he said, oh yeah, every time we went through Florida, Ian was there. Yeah, dude, it's just, and Blink just, they're just, they were such a fun band to be around. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, dude. I mean, as you were watching them traveling with them, kind of, <laughs> um, 
did you see the crowds like growing or did you know that they had something special? Because this is before they they blew up with Dammit and Enema, of course. I mean, did you feel that there was something special there? Uh, I I knew there was. And and the thing with the thing with that is that I always thought that them and Unwritten Law were both going to be huge. I just didn't know which one was going to get there first. But you mm-hmm. got to remember that with like, I went to a Unwritten Law Blink show, probably one of the ones I remember the most. Uh, it was in New Smyrna Beach at this place called Piper's. And dude, there might have been there might have been 20 people there. Mm. Like some of those pictures where I'm like right in front of them and there's like uh, there's like outlines of like bodies in the back on the wall, like little white, like spray painted sketches of bodies or something. Those shows were were tiny man it was just this this little like surf town and just going to see the shows like that that's like for me it's just it's awesome like sometimes you have a band and you're you're seeing them play in front of these small places and then they get bigger and then people are like oh they sold out i'm the complete opposite man i was so happy to see this band that i knew from the beginning um, at least the beginning of touring in Florida, um, become what they have and, and be that successful. And it's like, I felt like, I felt like I was a part of it almost, you know what I mean? Because the amount of people that I've told about Blink and Unwritten Law, you know, when you like a band and you're, the internet wasn't really as popular back then. So it was like word of mouth. So, yeah. you know, you'd like a band, you'd be like, dude, you got to see this band, check this band out. You got to come see them when they come through. And like, I was almost like a street team person for them without really being a street team person, you know? Yeah, dude. So, and then awesome. when, they, when they together got super popular, you're just like, you're just proud of them because you know how hard they work, you know? People from the outside being like, oh, they're sellouts, this and that. It's like, dude, you, you have no fucking clue. You, yeah. don't, you don't know how hard they worked. And fucking 15 of them piled in a fucking tiny van and touring like that and sleeping, you know, in shitty hotel rooms. Like, they earned every bit of the success that they got. And they deserve every bit of the success that they got. Yeah, that's a great point, man. I don't, people realize, like, how hard it is to, quote unquote, make it, you know? I mean, Blink was so DIY from every aspect. And like you mentioned, dude, like, playing to 10 people. A lot of people do that once and they can't take it. You know, they're traveling all over doing that, just building it up, gaining more fans. And then to finally make it, it's like, why would you shit on somebody for being like, you know, having some success or being able to buy a a house or a car or something? I've never understood that. It's like, I, I understand where people are coming from because they're from, if you're on the, you're on the outside looking in, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Some people, there's this band that they're passionate about and they're small and they want to keep it that way because they feel like they feel like they want it to be small so it's more special for them. Yeah. And then if it becomes bigger than they want it to, they have this sort of resentment where they're like, oh, well, it's not mine anymore. Now, like, it's kind of like a, a baseball team, you know? The baseball team they're garbage and they start winning and then all of a sudden people care yeah perfect example florida it is florida panthers hockey team we would go to so many games they would be empty now all of a sudden people are starting to care so the games are more crowded and so you're like man it was better when it was empty like the marlins games when nobody at all like the marlins when they moved to miami and the games were empty and you'd have like 30 seats around you you just kick your feet up it was great. <laughs> no one was no one was there. Was it fun for the players? I uh, highly doubt it. But when you when you're trying to go to the bathroom or something and there's no line, it, it's great. Yeah, yeah, that's a great analogy. It really is. And then it's like you ban. They start winning. They they sell out. It's like you bandwagon motherfuckers. Where were you when nobody was here? <laughs> yeah. So it's like I'm just I'm thankful that I knew about Blink then and I was able to see those small shows. Because everyone, everyone that I will talk to or they'll see those pictures and they'll be like, oh man, I'm I'm so jealous that you got to see them there. And I'm thinking like, man, I 
I don't even want to like the tickets are so expensive now through the Ticketmaster thing that I don't even want to pay like as much as I want to see them. I'm cheap, man. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to wait on I'm not going to wait for hours on a Ticketmaster website to buy tickets to go to a show. Yeah, yeah, it's tough when you probably were paying four or five bucks at most. You're probably getting in for free. Who knows? Yeah, after a while I was. I would and like my my whole thing, like people will watch like those old videos online, uh, like those warp tour videos. There's some from here is that maybe it's ninety six or ninety seven. I don't remember. Like the Pompano Beach one and the Jacksonville one. I'm on stage in the back. And so it's like embarrassing to watch now. Like and now I hate I hate being a stage potato. But back then I loved it. And I remember like uh the singer in my band he's like dude we always hated you we would go to shows and you were always that kid that was on stage with your fucking backpack and i'm like yeah my you know what was in my backpack i was like first off my free merch went into my backpack (laughs) and i was like i also had my bong and my weed so what i would do Back in the day, I would go to a lot of shows either with just my brother or I'd go by myself. At a young age, even before I knew like what a guest list was, I knew that if you have more than one person with you, your access is going to be limited. Yeah. So what I would do is I would, I would purposely. Um, I try not to make this too much about weed, but I, I I've been sober for eight years, so I can talk about this stuff. Now anyway. <laughs> I used to. Uh, I used to um, smoke really bad weed for like a couple weeks before um, a show was coming to town. And then I would save up my money to buy good weed. And then I'd bring the good weed and my bong in my backpack to a show. I'd roll up to the venue around noon. And as soon as I saw the band, as soon as they rolled up, I'd say, hey, you guys want to get high? And it then it would be like, oh, well, I don't smoke, but this guy does or that guy does. And then they're like, let me go drop my stuff off and we'll come back out. So they'd come back outside. They'd bring me in the venue. So I get to hang out with the bands all day, watch sound check. And they'd be like, oh, you want to you wanna get on the guest list? I'd be like, yeah. And then they'd be like, oh, do you want merch? And I'd be like, yeah. So I would just hang out and like party with the bands and then get free merch and get into the shows for free. <laughs> So you had a great was, strategy. There was a like a method to my madness, you know what I mean? Yeah, and all of that behind the scenes, I mean, seeing that side of things, did that inspire you at the time? Like, did you know, like, man, I want this lifestyle. I want to be out on a tour bus, rocking shows, rocking gigs. I mean, how did that line up with the bands you were kind of in at the time? Because I know you had Inner City Kids, Flip 60. How, timeline-wise, how did that line up? So I know, like, Inner City Kids, well, Inner City Kids, the funny thing about that is that we were, we were so bad, but we, uh, we knew like we needed to, we made like promo pictures and we made shirts and we had like a CD cassette, but before the CD was out, we already had shirts. I remember I have a picture of, uh, John Bell, the old bass player from Unwritten Law, like wearing our shirt at one of his shows, which was awesome. Because we only, I mean, we only made maybe 30 shirts at that. Before I even kind of knew what a tour bus was, I already had this vision of wanting to tour. Because the bands that I was going to see, none of them were in buses at that time. You know, they were all touring in 15 passenger vans. And so I think pretty early on, uh, Inner City Kids was happening uh, during those times of going to those shows. And then once we put out the demo, we realized how bad our singer was so then we kicked out our singer we re-recorded three out of the five songs which uh are the three that i didn't write how that turned out i don't know uh, because <laughs> like, back then i was working so like it wasn't like hey let's go in the studio and record it was like hey i'll go read parts and then you guys do your parts and while i'm working you know so yeah. Uh, We re-recorded three songs with our drummer singing, and that was our first demo. And then then I had a buddy who, uh, I know this kid that sings, you should should have him try out for your band. And that's when uh, he was, he introduced me to Jordan. Mm. And so we practiced with Jordan. We, uh, me and him started writing songs 
there with like breakdowns. And I was like, I was like, you know what? We gotta, we gotta change the band. And then the drummer's like, I don't want to do that. I quit. And then my buddy, Mike Cassini, who I'm still friends with, he's like, yeah, I'm just kind of over it. And I was like, all right. And then Jordan's like, I don't want to play guitar and sing anymore. I just want to sing. And I was like, all right. So we got, we got a bass player and we got a, a singer. Um, but the, the first practice, we practiced once, once or twice maybe, um, when we changed the name to Flip 60. And then the other guys just, that's when they quit. So Flip 60 was very short lived. It was just inner city kids with Jordan instead of the other singer and then some other songs and like i know like scrape knees the song that was on our first ep that was one of the ones that me and jordan wrote um an early version of that um and then uh yeah so then it was just me and jordan and then that's when uh that's when newfound glory formed wow when you had that first practice i guess with jordan i mean did you know right away there was something special there or was he just that much better than the, than the previous singer you had who was terrible? <laughs> so I think it was more like uh, he had more the same kind of interest in music that I kind of had, that same mm. kind of vision. Um, when we did Inner City Kids and we played those two shows, oh yeah, we only played two shows, by the way. Mm. Um, and we had like promo pictures and shirts and a, and a demo. We played two shows. I like, I in my head it was good um, until me and Jordan started kind of jamming a little bit. And then I was like, yeah, that's not good. But still, when it's your band, it's like, you're going to think that it's good no matter what. It, it's hard to judge your own music. Right. Uh, so um, I had I had the passion and the drive from like watching UL and Blink do it that I just knew that's what I wanted to do. But you got to remember, being in a band and getting any sort of success, it's a far-fetched dream. It's not, it's not something that's like a reality. Um, you could work as hard as you want, but it's still, it's still luck. It's hard mm. work, dedication, but it's also luck in the end. Mm. Yeah, so you guys, you, you bring in Chad. You've got an original guitarist. Uh, there was a different drummer at that time. You come together with the EP. It's all about the girls. I mean, tell us about kind of how that came together. Were you proud of it? Did you think it was going to go anywhere? Um, so with us, when, when Chad got in the band, Chad was in a hardcore band. He uh, sang in Shai Halut. So they already had some local traction. So in the beginning, when we started, people almost looked at it like we were Chad's side project. Mm. So like our, our first show, for example, there was probably like 50 people there, which normally your first show is, you know, maybe 10 people, your friends and your family, if you're lucky. Yeah. So the first show, even though I was out of tune, we probably sounded horrible. We had Amy from Fiddler Records come up and she's like, I want to I want to put out a release from you. And so I remember this differently than everyone else. And I maybe I remember it wrong. But I think the original discussion was to do two split seven inches. And so we went and we recorded five songs and then somehow the two seven inches didn't happen. And then she was just like, I'll just put out an EP. So for us, that was kind of cool because, you know, we were so Chad was on uh, Revelation Records at the time, full circle. I know because that's where our new uh, our new records coming out on. Yeah, but they used to do these like three song EP CDs. So for us, it was like, all right, we got five songs. We'll just do an EP. I thought at that time, I thought it was good. I was like really excited to be in this band. Um, did I know what was going to happen with it? No. But like I said, going back and watching UL and Blink and, you know, I always had this dream of being in a tour band. You know, I just didn't know happen or not i'm curious how supportive i guess were your parents at the time like i mean when you tell them i'm going to be in a band and i want to travel and play how did they react to that so how it worked for me um so i was in college at the time i went to college for one year at hillsborough community college in tampa i had a band there 
as far as I remember, we only played like one party. Um, and then uh, we had one drummer and he quit and then we got another drummer. I'm pretty sure my brother has the practice tape somewhere. I don't have it anymore, but I'm sure he does. Uh, and then after that year, I kind of like got into drugs up there. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to fucking, I'm going to go back home. So I left that college after, when I say drugs, I'm not, that's like more than weed, you know? Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to get out of here. So I left there. I came back here. I started Broward Community College for the first semester. And I was like failing math. And uh, I went to my dad and I'm like, I'm like, listen, I'm failing math. Do you care if I go like withdraw from that class? And his response was, I don't give a fuck what you do. Drop out of all your classes. Mm. So I went to school the next day and I withdrew from college. And then I came home and he's like, you're an idiot. I was like, you said drop out of all my classes. I just want to be in a band. I was like, I want to take my prepaid college fund. I want to go buy a new base. And then you can have all the rest of the money back. He's like, all right. So I cash prepaid college that I had. I went and bought uh, a Stingray at the time. Um, and then uh, and then that was it. And then I withdrew from college. And so starting out with Newfound Glory, you know, everyone else was in school but me. So I knew from going to hang out with bands, like, if you don't tour, you're not going to make it. You have to tour in order to be successful. Um, and, but everyone was like, dude, we're, we're going to school. Like, just because you're not working doesn't mean that we want to tour full time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it, was, it was basically a few things that, that happened to like get up to that touring level. I don't know if you want me to start talking about that now or I can continue with the story because that, uh, that pushes us right to where like Nothing Gold Could Stay came out. Yeah, I mean, and that's crazy because at that point, you're basically all in. So when you look back, even though your dad sounded pretty harsh at that time, when you look back, I mean, his answer there could have changed things. I mean, that's pretty crazy to look back on. It's it's a good thing that he was like that with you, really. Yes, correct. Because I I just knew I knew what I had to do because like I said, I would go to shows, I would bring pot, I would hang out with bands and I would talk to them all the time and everyone got the same answer. You got a tour. You got a tour. You got a tour. Mm. So, so then we uh we record Nothing Gold Could Stay. That uh that record uh I love that record. I wish that one day we would re-record it because that recording uh it was twelve hundred dollars to record that album. Wow. Um and we all would work and we would all bring our paychecks to pay for it. We like funded that ourselves because there was oh my no gosh. it was originally put on in eulogy and there was no recording budget. So we uh we put out uh, nothing gold could stay, and then that gets uh, that winds up getting picked up from drive through. We got contacted uh, from this label we've never heard of, and they're just like, "Oh, we uh, we have a distribution deal with uh, with uh, Universal and MCA." So when that record came out, um, and we got signed to drive through, we still weren't touring full time, but I just knew. That's the only way to make it. So I pulled Richard and Stephanie from Drive Through Records aside and I said, listen, I've been telling these guys nonstop that if we don't tour, we're not going to make it. You need to have this fake band meeting. Put us all in a room. Tell us all the only way we're going to succeed is if we tour full time. Right now is the time to do it. And we need to strike while the iron's hot and we need to be on tour full time. And so they put us in a room, had this fake meeting. Everyone bought it. Chad dropped out of high school. Everyone dropped out of school. Cyrus put his uh, college uh, scholarship on hold, and we started touring full time. Oh my gosh! So man, so that like fake meeting, I think, is kind of what like pushed us into that next category, and then that's kind of how the band our band had that like connection with Blink because we uh, we wound up being on this independent label. And I always, it's weird too, because I always wanted Rick DeVoe to be our manager because I knew that he managed Blink. 
Mm. I just didn't I just didn't know Rick at all. Even though Rick would he was the one that booked all those times they would come to Florida, like the Florida vacation tour. Rick was the one that booked all those. Um so like when we, we signed to uh drive through, they had that connection with MCA. Blink was on MCA at that time. And uh and so we wound up getting signed to MCA at the time. We didn't even we didn't even have a manager yet. Wow. So we were, I'm pretty sure we were signed to MCA before we even had a manager. Oh my gosh. And then we got Rick DeVoe to manage us after that. And that's kind of where our band kind of got looped in with, uh, with Link. Um, and I remember like, uh, we had like a band cell phone, uh, we had one cell phone that the band shared, which was for like for business stuff. So I never even, I never really, I don't even think I ever even used it. I used to use pay phones and a calling card. Um, but I remember we got a call on there one day and, uh, and, uh, it was Mark. He's like, Hey, it's Mark from blank. And whoever picked up the phone just hung it up. They're like, it's not Mark. <laughs> and I think, and then he called back again and it turned out it was, it was Mark. Um, so that was kind of, I think, where the friendship between us and Blink as a band, like, really kind of formed because we were on the same label. We wound up having the same manager. Um, they brought us on that tour, which was, for me, like, being in a band, I wanted to, like, tour with Unwritten Law. I wanted to tour with Blink. Mm. Yeah, dude. And you mentioned, you know, a little bit of luck involved with, with bands getting big or blowing up and dude, the time period right here. I mean, nothing gold can stay 1999 enema, of the States dropping pop punks exploding 2000, your guys self-titled albums. Just, I mean, incredible 2002 sticks and stones, like one of the most iconic pop punk albums of all time. You're paired there with blink. And I was going to hit on that, man, like new year's 2000, you guys play with blink for the first time. How crazy was that for you? Cause dude, this is like, it's not that far removed from when you were just the dude in the front row with 15 other people. Like how fucking rad was that playing on a stage, knowing that blinks right behind you. It was dude. It was crazy. I think that was the show that was like us blink Weezer um, lefty, I think played. And then I think it was like cut you up. Maybe I know I still have that, uh, that laminate somewhere. Um, I remember that show. Um, it was at Cox Arena too, I think. And so I remember walking out on stage and thinking, I I can't even feel my hands. Mm. Like I was that I was that nervous. I still I still get stage fright every single show we play. Even today. really, yeah, wow. always. Um, that's like for me, like part of the reason I like make the weird faces on stage is that I'm just uncomfortable. Um, especially with like people with cameras and stuff. So I figure like if I make a weird face into the camera, that almost helps me to lessen my anxiety sort of thing. It's just weird. It's weird to think being up there and just, I had this dream to be an abandoned tour, but I never realized like, okay, you're going to have a room full of people staring at you. <laughs> it's, like, it's like going in school and having to do like a speech in front of your class. It's not, it's not a fun thing to do. So when you're when I'm on stage, I'm like almost like I'm kind of like out of body. I'm in a different world. Mm. And then in my head, like I don't play like my instrument like most. I'm thinking like dots, no dots, dots, no dots, six fret. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know I know some of the notes, but when you get higher up the fretboard, I don't. I'm just uh, kind of just trying not to mess the song. <laughs> but like I remember it was it was it was crazy being like backstage in arena and then like at that time we i didn't fully like get it you know what i mean i was like oh weezer played i'm gonna like hang out here and try to meet weezer and then they like got off stage when they were done and just like walked right past everyone and straight to their dressing room and i was thinking like well that that sucked like i kind of wanted to meet him <laughs> thinking in the sense like okay they just finished their show they're sweaty they probably want to go dry off and shit they don't yeah. know who i just some random dude standing on the side of the stage. So, you know, it's like, it was kind of like a learning experience too. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
I mean, that, that show is that show is just insane. It, did you have? And again, it, it blows my mind how quick this kind of happened for you guys. I mean, it's like a three year period from like EP to like boom, top of the world. Did you have a kind of welcome to the big leagues moment that you remember, like when you walked out on a stage and you were like, oh my fucking God, this is crazy? Well, I mean, the first wake up call really was uh, the first tour we ever did. Um, we were supposed to do this tour with this band called The Agency. Um, and like, a few days before we're supposed to leave for this tour, uh, the guitar player's brother passes away. Mm -hmm. So they drop off the tour. And we're like, damn, we're not even old enough. No one in our band's old enough to rent the rider truck. So <laughs> now we got a tour. And that's when uh, this band called the Bacon Andes stepped in, who is Chris Caraba from Dashboard. This was his old band. And they were a local band that we're friends with. And they jumped in and they're like, we'll do the tour with you. So our first tour ever, was with us in uh, Vacant Andes. Um, we played a show in Pennsylvania and there was one person there. Oh my gosh. So my first wake up call of like, oh man, I wanna be in this touring band was getting up on stage and realizing that one person was at your show. Mm. That was the first wake up call. Um, I don't know if that's the wake up call that you were kind of talking about. You're talking about like, oh, the, your successful sort of wake up call. Well, that's interesting, though, That's because I hadn't thought about the question that way, but that's a great point. Did that teach you anything? I mean, right away, was that a learning point? Like, fuck, we got to get some flyers out, or we're going to have to sell ourselves more or anything? And th but that's the thing, though, with, with us and, our, and, and touring, dude, we worked really hard to make a name for ourselves. When the, the, the thing, there's a few things. First, we got, um, anytime we would play a show, we all were like, in different areas we all had different groups of friends that we were in you know three different high schools and i was out of high school so we would make flyers and we were all flying to different people so when you'd go to a newfound glory show it was different kind of people because i hung out with like heavy metal kids and weirdos and jocks and like so it wasn't this like punk rock thing like oh jocks can't come we had everyone there would be like punk rock, emo kids, ska kids, hardcore kids, you know, regular working people. We just had a wide range of people that would come to our shows. And when, in our local scene down here, the thing that was great is that everyone supported everyone. So if you'd go to our show, it could be like Newfound Glory, a hardcore band, a ska band, an alternative band. Like everyone played together and everyone supported everyone where a lot of the other scenes were like closed down, like only the hardcore bands played together, or only the punk bands played together. We played with everyone and everyone played with everyone and everyone supported everyone. So that's what made the scene down here really special. But I remember like uh, Nothing Go Could Stay came out and MXPX was the first band uh, that was like a bigger band, I think, that like hooked us up locally. They gave us four shows in Florida. And that was the first four days that Nothing Go Could Stay was out on Eulogy. Mm. And we sold like over 100 copies a night. Mm. Um, so I knew, I knew that we had something then. Um, I just knew that if we didn't tour and we didn't get the right tours, we would just never get to that level. And then like bands like Real Big Fish and Less Than Jake, they, they kind of, you know, gave us a chance. Less Than Jake was the one band like MXPX gave us those four shows in Florida, but Less Than Jake was the first band that like took us on an actual tour that kind of brought us under our wing and kind of like taught us the rights and wrongs of touring. Damn, that's pretty rad. Yeah. Speak, speaking of touring, 2001 summer, you guys go out with Blink and Alkaline Trio. Holy hell, we need this tour to come back. What are your memories on, on that summer? And the, the craziest thing, the craziest thing that I could remember about that was that for me, my dream, like starting in a band, was to tour with Blink. I wanted to be in a band, I wanted to tour with Blink. And then it actually happens. And dude, it was just, it was crazy. Do you know what I mean? We, I always have had this sort of thought in my mind that I try to play every show like it's my last show. And I try to play every show like there's more people there than there are um mm -hmm. 
because in those blink shows some of those shows like all the seats in the front aren't filled but you need to perform like they're all filled you know what i yeah. mean yeah um it's just one of those things where it's kind of like shooting a video where you almost have to you have to pretend and you have to give your all because there's you know there could be someone at your show who they don't obviously they're there to see blink you know what i mean this is blink's tour so you're going out there and they're like these people may have no idea who you are they may not know your songs um and they may be looking at you like you suck the second you go out there but you need to like you need to win fans over you know what yeah. i mean you need to get on stage and you need people to leave there going oh man that band was pretty good let me go check them out and i think that tour helped us a lot uh of gaining new fans um because you have to remember like there's different kinds of fans in this world there's you know there's we always toured a lot before we were on radio and mtv um and then we always uh because when radio and mtv ends a lot of those fans are gone there's yeah. a lot of fans are there when something's promoted really on a big level but they don't know when club shows are coming and they don't know if your records came out because they're not paying attention to you because they're you don't they don't hear you on the radio and back then there, it wasn't like streaming and you know all that stuff wasn't as big so you just kind of you're just trying to tour and, and gain as many fans as you can and then for us once the mtv and the radio were gone we still kind of had a core audience um to kind of help us to where we could still tour you know what i mean where yeah. some fans they get really big on radio right away and then they break up the next year because their song's not on the radio anymore and they don't have a fan base. Yeah. Yeah. Did you watch bl those blink shows quite a bit? Like once you guys were done, would you watch from side stage or go out in the lawn or something? I would, I would watch a lot from front of house because uh, they had pyro on stage. So mm. I tried, it was, the stage was kind of like limited access. Um, but yes, I would watch blink a lot on that tour. Um, it's just, uh, dude, I mean, that tour was just incredible. I'm just waiting for the day that they're like, Hey, we should like do the 20 year anniversary of that tour. Let's, uh, let's do that tour again. You know what I mean? Oh, that'd, that'd be so, awesome tour. so sick. So sick. I, dude, I always have heard that at that time they were just so big and inaccessible that they would kind of get driven up 10 minutes before their set starts, pop their in-ears on, you know, rip the show and then dip out. I mean, were they hanging out backstage quite a bit? Do you remember like, I guess what the backstage scene was like for them? So for me, um, I didn't hang out with them a ton on that tour. Um, they definitely hung out a little bit, but you have to remember they, their days were packed with press. Mm -hmm. They had so much press to do they and they all had their own buses so it was everyone was kind of like separated you know what i mean yeah they did hang out i know like chad hung out with them a bunch i remember like uh one day we were hanging out and i think uh mark was like throwing like a box of cereal around and like throwing food or something we were like oh man that was great and then like one day we did it in our dressing room and then we got like our rider taken away for three shows or something like that. And <laughs> that's, when realized, that's when we realized like, okay, we're not headlining. We can't like leave a mess in the dressing room. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. But, but like, I know Chad, Chad hung out with them a lot on tour. Um, it's like, I knew Blink from way back when, and they're great guys, but I'm also very kind of awkward and social anxiety kind of person so i never really kind of go out of my way to hang out with people and i was probably in the bus just smoking weed the whole time <laughs> you know before show i'd watch the show i was always i mean i was always high on that tour so 2002 you know when you guys are, are putting together the sticks and stones album a lot of people don't know but mark played bass on the song something i call personality how did that come together and what was that like having him in the studio with you um, so the way for me, like both of my brothers are kind of hippies. They like one brother is like likes fish and Grateful Dead, you know what I mean? The other one loves the Allman Brothers band. And they would always like uh talk about like, oh, this guy's sitting in with this guy, or this person's sitting in with this guy, you know? And they always would like put that sort of stuff in my mind. And I remembered um on Unwritten Law Oz Factor, 
uh, Brian Baker from Bad Religion played a guitar solo, I think, on one of the songs. And I always was like, man, that's like the coolest thing. I was like, you know, I, I love Hoppus's bass playing and he was like a big inspiration on me. It would be cool for him to like play a song on the record. Um, so we asked him and he did it. Um, so it was great. But the, the only problem that I have with it is that I don't, I don't even know if I'm playing the song exactly how he played it on the recording. I don't, <laughs> I don't, he kind of like wrote his parts. Mm. Uh, so uh, I play it how I think he played it, but I don't, I, I wasn't really like staring at the bass while he was like playing. I was just kind of like, this is fucking awesome. You know, <laughs> like one of your biggest inspirations, you know, playing a song on your album. Uh, so for me, it like, that still like means a lot to me, you know, and a lot of people don't even know that he played on the record. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and I was wondering like, if you had the bass part written and he came in and you kind of showed it to him or if he just walked in, listened to it and had free reign and, and now you're trying to learn how to play it. <laughs> yeah. He, I mean, he came in, you could tell like on the bridge part. Yes. Yep. That, I mean, that's his style, you know? Totally. I mean? Um, so yeah, it's definitely, uh, I, I don't even, like I said, I don't even know if I play it the way that he does. Um, I don't even know if he even still remembers what he played, but, um, but for me that, that still like means a lot to me. That's um, cool. Yeah. That's yeah. a really cool highlight. Keeping with the, the Mark Hoppus theme here. So 2008 ish, you guys are getting ready to put out a new album. Uh, what will become not without a fight on epitaph Mark Hoppus produce that how did that happen uh and you know any takeaways or memories from working in that environment with him so that that record for me was like a little bit of a blur um because i uh i think my son was born when was this 2005 uh 2008 ish 2008 okay so this was I think right around 2008 was right around when my daughter was born, Chloe. Um, so I was, I wasn't there the whole time. So I, I think I came out for like pre-production and then I left and went back home. And then I came out to do my bass parts and then I left again. Um, so I was only there for a short amount of time. So my memories from that are a little bit vague. And of course I was high the whole time. The way, <laughs> the way that I would do stuff then is I would basically smoke pot from the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep. But in the studio, um, when I was recording, I would like, we're getting ready to record a song, I'd go out and smoke. And then I'd record the song. And then while they were editing the song, I would go out and smoke again. And then I'd come back in and just punch in any parts. So my memories from that recording are very vague because um, I was high the whole time and I wasn't there the whole time. I gotcha. This is right around the time really that Blink was getting back together for their reunion. I'm wondering, like, did you have any insight to that or did you know that was coming? No, I didn't. But I do remember one thing I do remember is uh, like when we were in the studio, uh, I brought, whenever I record, I bring, uh, like my, I have a studio base that I use. Um, and I remember like, uh, I think we plugged in Mark's base and then we plugged in mine and we just liked the sound of mine better. Mm. So I, I could have used uh Mark's base on the recording, but I used mine. Um, but that's like one of those things that's just like, I don't know. I wish I wish that I was sober more back then to kind of remember things more and enjoy things more. Yeah. But I, I was kind of just enjoying things in my own way, I guess. But I can recall one thing that's funny is years later, um, you know, sometimes when you have music playing in your car and it's really low and it's just kind of in the background. Yeah. You, you hear it, but you don't really hear it. So I'm riding with my buddy. I think we're on the way to, a, to go to a Marlins game. And he's got just like a shuffle thing going on in his phone. And there's a song playing and I'm talking to him and I'm like, man, song sounds familiar. I'm like, what are you listening to? And he's like, really? I'm like, 
no, what are you listening to? And he's like, uh, it's your song off Not Without a Fight. <laughs> because, because the song that he was listening to, I was there for pre-production. I was there for recording, but the vocals weren't written yet. Oh. And so I, I don't really go back and listen to our records unless I need to like learn something for tour. Yeah. So when we're getting all the, the things back and forth, like, oh, listen to the mixes and what do you think about this and that? There's so many ideas going around that I never say anything. You know what I mean? <laughs> just like, I'm just going to let them, you know, take the reins and say what they want. And just hope in the end it doesn't turn out like uh, Injustice for All, where like my face just gets erased. <laughs> so, like I just never, I never heard the song finished with lyrics before. I only knew the music, so the music sounded familiar to me, but I just didn't, I didn't even know that it was us. That's funny, um, dude. You guys got a lot of songs. You got a lot of records. I mean, you guys started in '97 and really haven't stopped. Yeah, yeah it's been, <sighs> been been a long ride. I'm going to fast forward just a little bit here. You guys got to get out this this past summer, celebrate 20 years of Sticks and Stones uh, with those shows. What's it mean for you guys to get out there and, and still just have these crowds going nuts to that album? It's it's crazy, man. We're just very grateful that, you know, you have, like I said, I, I always say you have this far-fetched dream. And for that dream to become a reality, it's insane. But you're also like... Like I said, I think differently than everyone. So I'll say, like, I'm so grateful for everything, but I think, like, the tiniest bit of success you want, it just makes you want more. Do you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I don't know how it works for everyone, but I'm sure some bands that are, like, arena bands, they're like, man, I wish we were a stadium band. You always want more than you get. You know what yeah. I mean? So I'm thankful, obviously, for sure. <clears throat> But I would, I would love to be an arena man. But in the same time, um, you can't complain with the success you have and you need to be grateful for what you have. Because, you know, every show that you play, these people are paying their hard-earned money to come and see your band play. Yeah. Uh, and they could be doing anything. And some people are paying for a babysitter. And some people, you know, everyone's got things going on in their life. And so even when I go to shows and even when I play shows, that's kind of like your escape. You know what I mean? Where people yeah. go to shows, they forget about their life for a second and their hardships and all the trouble they're going through. And they just enjoy the show. When I'm up on stage, it's the same thing. I just forget all the shit that I'm going through and, you know, just focus on having a good time. It's like everything for me, it's kind of like thought out, even like, you know, guitar picks. When I was 13 years old, I went and saw Metallica play with my older brother. He bought me uh, for my birthday a ticket to see Metallica. So I flew to, to Tallahassee and went and saw them play. Got two guitar picks from Jason Newstead. Mm. A show with a guitar pick from a band you like, it's pretty awesome. Dude, for sure. So yeah. now I'll make like, I'll, each show I'll use like 20 picks. Do I need 20 picks? No. But I try to throw them out. That way, maybe someone leaves that show with the same feeling that I had when I left that Metallica show. Oh, man, that's rad. That's so rad, dude. Like the small things like that. Because um, when you break it down, I'm just a fan that's in a band. Mm. I mean, dude, that's cool. Yeah, because I'm the same way, man. Like, I, actually, right here, it's kind of hard to see. But I have all the guitar picks I've gotten from Blink shows right there framed. And what I love about each one, that's why I love collectibles in general, there's a story behind every single thing and a special moment and a special point in time. And like you, and, and this is what sucked with with COVID and not being able to obviously perform and, and go to shows. Dude, music to me, they're like my escapes, my vacations, you know, live shows. When you go there and sync up with the crowd and you're listening to your favorite band and favorite songs, nothing else matters. I was watching a show the other day I was watching a video of a, a neck deep show and instead of looking at the band, I was watching the crowd and I was almost brought to tears just watching how much it meant to everybody in the crowd. And you could tell that there was nothing else on their mind. It was so special, dude. Yeah, it, dude, it, it's awesome. I, I remember I saw, I saw blink open for squirt gun in, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, at this place called Joe Mocha's. Um, 
and I went over to Hoppus at the merch booth and asked for a pick, and he gave me a used pick out of his pocket, and it was just an orange Dunlop pick before they even had customs. Yeah. Um, this was probably, uh, you probably know more than me if that was on the Cheshire Cat tour or if that was on the Dude Ranch tour, but I still have that pick now, and that was before they even had like a Blink logo on them. It's just wow. like an orange Dunlop pick that I, that I still have. Man, yeah, that would have been 95 or 96. Because I know getting into Dude Ranch, they have that Dude Ranch logo on some picks. Man, that's so rad. So cool. You strike me as the type that loves, like, meeting fans or, like, when fans bring rad, you know, old Newfound Glory items and such. Like, when it comes to Newfound Glory, I guess, collectibles or just rad things, like, what's some of the coolest shit you see at meet and greets or that fans bring? It's weird. I mean, I have some pretty, the coolest collectible that I have still is probably the, uh, the Steve doll. I, when I used to travel, I used to bring the Steve from Blues Coos doll with me everywhere. It was like, you could see him like in the back of our videos, like the My Friends Over You video, he's wearing like a tuxedo sitting on our amp. Um, I still have that thing. Um, and I used to save, I used to save everything. I mean, everything from like old flyers and, and posters. I used to get posters from every show. Mm. I, would get, uh, I would save like hotel room keys. I would save like airline tickets. I just had so much stuff. I would save one of every single T-shirt that we ever made. Wow. Um, we, did a, uh, we did an eBay sale a while ago where I just sold... Uh, like all those shirts that I had collected. So I was like, you know, I never expected to be a band this long. I thought, you know, we'd be a band for a few years and, you know, have a couple of albums and then I just have something to show my grandkids. But then it turned into, you know, a 400 shirt collection. I'm like, I, I just don't, <laughs> I don't need these anymore. I'd rather these like be with people that would appreciate them. But yes. it's, I always, I'm very into the collectible. So what I'll do, and I also collect like sports cards and stuff like that too. So when we record records, every song that I record, I'll use a different guitar pick. I'll save that guitar pick and write what song I recorded it with. Oh, I'll shit. Save, I'll save the strings that I use to record the album. And then when we're done recording, I'll trade the strings and the picks to other people for like sports cards and stuff that I like on eBay. Oh There's shit. A, a handful of fans uh, that have become friends that I just trade with. And they're always like, dude, save me this, save me that, save me this, save me that. And then we'll just say, okay, what's a good value? Do this stuff a value? I'll go on eBay and say, okay, buy me this card, this card, and this card. And then I'll give them that stuff. So then it turns out that they get something really special and unique. You know, and then I get a sports card that I want. That's sick. Yeah. So it's like I feel weird just selling stuff. Yeah. So try to make it like a trade, you know? Yeah. Do you still have your first EP? You have to. Uh, it's all about the girls. Yeah. Actually, I had it in the other room. I was unpacking a, a thing in my kid in my son's closet and I saw a copy of it there. But the I have the second press. So the second press was like a green CD. The first mm. press was the Baby Blue CD. Um, I think I might still have a copy or two of the first press still sealed, but I, they may be at my brother's house. That first one seems hard to find, man. How many of those were made? Do you have any idea? There was a thousand with the light blue CD and a thousand with the green CD. Okay. Interesting. There was, there was just one online that was like, the original press autographed by all of us, and it was going for like 700 bucks. Oh my gosh, dude. Yeah, I'm a big autograph collector, especially like in the Blink realm, dude. My Blink autograph collection is gnarly. And what I like about those and what, what would have been cool about that piece is they're little timestamps, man. So if that was like the original lineup that signed that in 1997, I could see that being fucking huge collectible. Yeah, and it was like, it was like, before he really even had signatures too. And <laughs> so like, you know, like I signed it like Ian City Kids. Chad signed it like Chad Halud. Um, so it was uh that was definitely I wonder if it's still on there. I'm I'm searching right now to see if it's on there. 
it's always fascinating to me how folks' signatures change over time with, you know, the more that they're signing and such. It's it's just a cool, you and I could probably talk forever about this stuff. My homie, Alan Corona, I think brought you a bass out on that tour. How's that Alan, bass, how's that bass treating you? Alan is great, man. He is, he is such a genuine dude, man. I, I saw him like, uh, I I, I, one of my my friends, Ty, I think, told me about him. And I started like looking through it. I'm like, oh man, this kid builds great bases. And then I started talking to him a little bit. And he's just like, you know, sometimes you meet people and they have like ulterior motives. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're kind of like two dimensional. He's like one of those dudes where you meet and he's just such a genuine, nice dude. Yeah. Such a good guy, man. You got that psycho smoke in the middle, dude. Where where did that come from, by the way? Okay, so psycho smoke. My uh, my first band that I was ever in, uh, we were called Psychedelic Smoke. Oh shit. Um, so it's just kind of that's just, psycho smoke is just kind of like a take on that. You know what I mean? I gotcha. I never. Uh, it's like I'm one of those people that like hate social media. But it's like, it's one of those things you just have to do. Yeah. Oh, totally. I spend too much time on my phone looking through like stupid reels and stuff like that. <laughs> um, I wish, I wish I did not have to do social media at all. And I think it's like one of those things you just kind of have to do. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, especially in your position, dude, with band promo and tour dates and such, you have to. All right, you guys got a new album, a uh, new tour, Make the Most of It. Album drops January 20th. Tour kicks off actually near me, St. Louis, January 28th, running through March. You got some acoustic shows lined up. Uh, what can you tell us about the new album? The new album, it's definitely, it's definitely something different for us because it's obviously a full acoustic album, um, which is something we've never done before. Um, I could tell you that uh, this, this tour is one that I'm most nervous for. I'm about to get down to start rehearsing everything because the you know the strumming patterns for some of these songs that we've been play, playing for years they change when you play them acoustic so yeah. i have to go back and like make sure i know how to play some of these and some of these songs we haven't played in a long time or ever so um I, it's just finding time where there's quiet and there's no kids around um, <laughs> um to find time to rehearse so i'm really excited about uh getting on the road and doing these i'm just like i get that anxiety in my head of making sure i know how to play everything before we get there um so the record i'm really excited for the fact that it's on revelation records so like i was saying earlier it's like full circle because that's like the label that chad was on when we first started with his old band um so it's really awesome to put a uh a record out on that label and then this tour should be interesting you know it's something we've never done obviously you're energy level is going to be brought on by people singing along because uh you know we're not plugged in at all so we'll see how it goes i mean you just got to hope for the best it's split into two different legs so hopefully uh you know everything goes well and uh it should be fun and something different for people to see yeah yeah the the new single get me home just came out dude i was listening to this and it's so melodic i love it, it was so catchy and then I started honing in on the lyrics and listening to the lyrics. Dude, I was brought to tears. Like, if you read the lyrics and the content that this is about, I mean, obviously, folks listening probably know that the Chad guitarist has gone through multiple health scares. Uh, this is some deep content, man. It's heavy shit talking about, you know, missing out on his daughter's first steps. Uh, surgeon, please don't miss. Uh, I mean, he's got the band and fans that he doesn't want to disappoint. I mean, this seems like it's going to be some heavy stuff. The, uh, that's one of the things like I, <clears throat> I love about Chad's lyrics is they're just, uh, they're straight to the point. They're not, you know, some people when they write, they're writing and it's like, like, what is this song even about? Um, but he's just like straight to the point. You know what I mean? He's like, this is what I'm feeling. And bam, he puts it down on paper, which for me, like, uh, you know, my lyric writing has always been like, hey, we're missing a line on here. What would be good? And I could fill in a blank, but I could never sit down with an empty canvas and like write my feelings down. Yeah. Um, but Chad's really, he's good with that. I mean, there's a song, Stubborn, on uh, on Resurrection, where there was something I wanted to 
write about, but I'm like, dude, I can't, I can't write lyrics. So I called him and talked to him for like a half hour, 40 minutes or so on the phone, told him everything that was going through my mind. He hung up the phone and then he wrote stubborn. So, Damn. you know, it's, a. Uh, it's like, it just, it sucks that, you know, he's had to go through, you know, all the stuff that he's going through, but um, I think it just makes you stronger as a person. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And it, uh, he said too, it's like, you know, a lot of times people get sick and they pass away and, you know, everyone posts online how much they, you know, appreciated that person. Um, and it, but he got to hear all those things from all the people that he loves now while he's still alive mm. um, you know Man. seeing how many people from the outside you know care um so he's just he's such a strong dude so um you know he'll get through it but i definitely he definitely put his heart on his sleeve with the lyrics on this uh on this album yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm stoked for you guys, man. I'm stoked for that album. So uh, you can get tickets, newfoundglory.com. You've got tickets, you've got VIP packages. I'm going to try to get out there. You guys start off in St. Louis, January 28th. I'm going to try and make it, man. I really am. All right, hit me up. I'm, I'll put you uh, I'll put you on the guest list if you want to come. That'd be rad. I'll hit you up for sure. Last thing I want to hit on, and then I'm going to get some uh, some rapid fire questions and I'll get you out of here. You are on an Allen and Jenter Tops baseball card. How fucking stoked were you? And where does this line up with your career accolades? <laughs> okay, so so as a kid growing up, my first dream was to be in the NHL, but I couldn't skate, so that that dream is scrapped. My second dream was to be a baseball player. Um, I played baseball up until right around high school started. I was a good enough catcher to catch in high school, but I wasn't a good enough hitter. So I quit playing baseball and started playing guitar instead. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I was really good. I was great in the field, but as soon as people started throwing curveballs, I couldn't hit shit. Um, so then, uh, so then my dreams of playing baseball were gone, but I got to live that dream because, uh, I became friends with, uh, a couple of baseball players, uh, First baseball player I became friends with was John Baker. Uh, he used to play for the Marlins. And I went and hung out with him after a spring training game. And he brought this guy, Brad Davis, with him, who at the time was like one of their backup catchers. Um, Brad started the season in AAA. So I was like, dude, I want to come and hang out in New Orleans and go to some games. So the first year I went, I went for four games, hung out with him. And then the next year, I went for eight days, for nine days. It was a four game homestand, a day off and another four game homestand. So I went and hung out with the team for eight days. I got to like take batting practice with the team one day. I got to catch uh, three pitchers in the bullpen, um, which that for me was like the dream come true. I, I caught Tom Kohler. Uh, oh shit. I know Tom. Yeah, so I caught Tom. And dude, he throws gas, dude, mm. in the 90s. But they, so I had like Brad's catcher's gear and they gave me like this, uh, it was like a bone thing to put over your thumb, but I couldn't close the, the, the catcher's mitt quick enough with it on there. So I was like, fuck it, I'm taking this thing off. So I caught Tom in the bullpen. He's throwing like 90 plus, but he's giving like, me like these hand signals like, oh, it's a curveball, it's a fastball. You know, like the, the signals he'll give with his glove before he's pitching a bullpen. Yep. I last caught in Little League. <laughs> the last time I caught when well, I was 12. So I'm going from not catching in, since I was 12 to then having full gear on and catching in the 90s. And like, he blew my thumb up. Oh. He, he hit my thumb so hard. And I was like, oh, my God, this hurts so bad. This hurts so bad. But, <laughs> but what did I do? I threw the ball back to him, and I kept catching. And then after him, I caught Rob Delaney, and then I caught Eli Villanueva. So I caught three pitchers in the bullpen. And my, I mean, I couldn't close my thumb for probably like two or three weeks. Oh, my God. <laughs> but that was like the dream. I got to hang out with the team. I got to catch bullpens. You know, as a little kid, I remember – 
I think that I think his name was like Todd Malden. Uh, he was, uh, I think, a bullpen catcher for the Dodgers. And I was like, man, that's what I want to do. Mm. I knew like I, I was a good catcher, but I couldn't hit. And I was like, dude, I could be a professional bullpen catcher. That'd be sick. Um, so that was kind of the dream. And then I caught Kohler and I was like, OK, I could not do this. <laughs> um, so I got to live that dream. So then uh, I saw a post going back to the real question. I see a post online um, that says, who do you think should be in the set this year? So I replied me. And then I made a post on my thing telling people following me, go and tell them it should be me. And then within like an hour, hour and a half, I had a direct message from them saying that they'd like me in the set. Oh, man, that's rad. Yeah, it was awesome. So then they they send me like a mock up of the card and they found like this random picture off like Google images from like 10 years ago. And I was like, I don't really like that. Can I like pick my own picture? And they're like, let us know what you have. So then I hit up my friend Paris. I'm like, Paris, I need one of your pictures to be on this card. So we sent them some pictures and that's the one that they picked. And then even cooler than that, they wanted the relic. So I'm like, what would be cool? I'm going to give him the exact shirt that's in the picture to be one of the shirts from the relics. Oh, I didn't realize that. That's awesome. I gave them two of my stage worn shirts because I'm like, I'm all into like the game used, stage worn, that sort of stuff. So I oh, gave yeah. them two shirts that I wore on stage for full tours. And then that's what they cut up for the relics. So there's one that's my design from Roosevelt that's Love Overload. That's the one that's like the more colorful one. And then all the other ones are the El Mantel, which is the exact shirt that's in that picture. That's awesome. Have you pulled yourself out of a pack yet? So I have not pulled myself out of a pack yet. Um, I've attempted three times and i failed all three times but i have <laughs> seen myself pulled in breaks i bought a break on uh on ebay so i saw some like base cards get pulled in a break um, but they didn't play anything good but i have acquired some off of ebay um i got the there's the i got the one out of ten signed in red mini mm. i got the uh, my buddy ty got me the one out of 25 silver auto um i got the one out of one silver mini i got the um one out of five red mini oh shit so i've gotten a few of the good ones um, i'm still trying to get the printing plates they haven't appeared yet i'll try and keep an eye out how how stoked are you going to be on tour when someone brings you one of those to sign um it's pretty awesome i actually someone was hitting me up they call it like through the mail signing yeah ttm TTM. So I opened up a PO box because people kept asking about TTM. So I was like, all right. I was like, I'll sign. So I set up a PO box and told them I'll sign 10 bucks for a card, 15 for a relic. And then uh, if people send them to me, then I'll take that money. And then I take that money and go toward eBay. And then I buy some of my own cards with money. Oh, hell yeah. Dude, you got, you got all these trades worked out, man. This goes back to you like with the dankest weed hanging out by the buses. You got this stuff all figured out. Yeah, you got to give a little to get a little. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, dude, I'm going to get you out of here with some rapid fire, man. This has been such a pleasure. You ready for the for the rapid fire? Sure. All right. Favorite Blink album all time? Uh, dude Ranch. Okay. I thought you were going to say Chester Cat. All right. Uh, favorite Blink song all time? <sighs> Is it uh is is it emo? The do 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 Yes. Do, 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 do. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Man, that bass line's killer. All right. Um, any advice to like upcoming bands, younger musicians? I'm sure you guys get hit with this a lot, but just any advice for bands kind of trying to to make their stamp in this world? Yes. Yeah, so I would do exactly what we did. Anytime a band came through town and I thought that their fans might like our band, we made a bunch of flyers. Right as the encore is about to start, leave the show, go outside, and flyer to everyone leaving the show. Mm. Um, back when we would do, I would buy a spool of like 100 CDRs, and I would sit there for hours and hours making burned CDs of our songs, and I would hand out burned CDs with the flyers as people would leave the shows. So, I mean, out of the 100 that I sat there making, Maybe 80 of them turned into Frisbees on the highway. 
<laughs> but if you know, if just say six out of the hundred liked it, then they're going to play it for their friends and help spread the word. Um, don't think that making a post on social media, people are going to show up at your show. You got to work to get people at your shows. Man. Make flyers and promote yourself because in the end, no one cares about your band as much as you're going to care about your band. So you're going to get, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. That is such a great point. And I, I think a lot of kids and maybe it's my generation or just under me, they, they think that something's just going to be given to them and it's not. I mean, you have got to go out and make it happen. And it always reminds me, there's a Tommy Lasorda quote that I always go back to. He says, how bad do you want it? And what are you willing to do to get it? Yeah. It's like, it's so hard. Like I'm one of those people that's like, people may think that I'm a dick because I'm honest. And sometimes I'll tell people what they don't want to hear. So sometimes I'll get a, hey, dude, check out my band. We just recorded, blah, blah, blah. What do you think? And it's like, well, there's a few things. One, I'm not a songwriter. You know what I mean? Chad's our songwriter. I, I can help arrange a little bit. So if I'm, I'm not really like, I'm more into like 80s music now than I am into like pop punk. So if people are giving me a pop punk record and what do you think? If I automatically take it and say oh yeah it's great well then that's going to lead into dude can we open up for you in this show or can you yeah. take us on tour i'm not going to tell you it's great unless i think it's great so i may say okay it's good but i don't really listen to that style of music or like my buddy i have a buddy's band and i'm like dude your your songs are decent but your, your singer's not decent <laughs> so it's like, I don't want to be a dick by telling him that, but it's like, I think if they had a better singer, they would, they would do better. Yeah. And that's one of the things with Jordan too. I think that Jordan has one of those voices that's like, it could be like a love hate. Either you, you love it or you don't, you know? And that's one of the things that was huge with Blink is like when they first started, you know, they had the perfect combination of both. Like if, if Tom was singing and and you got tired of hearing like the nasally singing, then Mark comes in and sings. Yeah. Right? So they'd each have their own songs. And then the song that they would both like sing together, you're like, dude, this is awesome. Yeah. Just, their voices just mesh so great together. I always think of Mark and Tom. And then I think of like, uh, like uh, Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, like, bon, bon Jovi's voice without Richie Sambora's harmonies, it's, not great. I, I I love Bon Jovi, but it's like it's not the same without Richie Sambor in that band. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. Last one. And I think you'll you'll like this one because obviously you're a collector and, and I am as well. So I like to ask this of all my guests. Theoretically, house is on fire, family's safe, pets are safe, everybody is safe. You can go in and grab one item. What are you grabbing? to save and why um i would probably grab my green sparkle uh custom fender p base with the pot leaves on the inlays because that was the uh the first uh custom base that fender gave me mm -hmm. which, which by the way i never would have had a fender deal had it not been for mark hoppus getting me a fender deal really how'd that play out because Mark was the one that talked to Fender for us because he had a Fender deal. Mm. Oh, and then another small thing that I just thought of thinking of uh, Blink. Um, there is a cover of Kerrang! magazine that we were on where we're in the ocean um, and we're holding our instruments. And I remember going, dude, I only have like one bass or two basses. I'm not bringing my bass into the ocean. <laughs> If my bass gets wet, I'm screwed. So um, Rick DeVoe's assistant at the time, Chris Georgian, he went to the Blink storage and he grabbed one of uh, Hoppus's old Stingrays, like a baby blue Stingray. And he gave it to me for the photo shoot, which turned out it didn't get wet at all. So I could have used my own. But I was like, man, I got this, I got this Fender hookup now. I can't have like an Ernie Ball bass in the cover of a magazine. 
Mm. So if you look at the picture, it's me holding Hoppus's base, but I'm holding it backwards. So you can't see the front that it's a stingray. And then right after the photo shoot, I gave it back to Chris and he went and put it back in their storage. Oh my gosh. That is a great little fun fact. I'm going to find that. I'm going to post that on the pod Instagram because I bet nobody knew that until just now. Yeah, I bet you Hoppus probably didn't know that till right now. That's a cool, fun fact. All right, dude. Man, this this was such a pleasure. I appreciate your time. He's at Psycho Smoke. Uh, go out and catch him on the tour. I'll hit you up if I can make it on the 28th, dude. I'm going to try to. All right, man. Have a good one, man. Good talking to you. You too. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ian. Later.